presentation is on the topic various drug toxicities in renal transplant recipients let me request the chairperson to invite and introduce the speaker welcome professor surya she is going to address a uh, topic on the topic on various drugs toxicity in renal transplantation before she go to topic let me give a brief introduction she is professor of pathology direct electron microscopy laboratory and chief renal pathologist division at bell cornell medicine cornell medical center new york her, her main areas of interest are renal pathology electron microscopy of renal renal and neonatal tissues she has got awards like jacob chug award from renal pathology society she has contribution and service to the pediatric neonatology the council of pediatric neonatology and urology kidney and urology foundation for the renal pathology society she has been president of renal pathology society for nine she has she contributed to diagnostic pathology renal disease and transplantation series of 2011 and transplant pathology series the member consensus work group in glomerular differentiation anti phospholipid anti phospholipid antibodies lupus nephritis thrombotic microangiopathy em in lupus nephritis recurrent de novo glomerular disease in glomerular diseases and she is co director she had been co director in a seminar in summer school of renal pathology in italy in 2011 she had more than 165 publications and written 30 chapters and books over to dr surya thank you sir for your kind introduction uh, i would like to thank the organizers for um, inviting me to participate in this meeting especially dr pallav gupta i hope you can all hear me and also see my power my presentation okay so uh, today the topic that was given to me was various drug toxicities in renal transplant uh, recipients after dr paramjit's uh, talk uh, on molecular pathology this will be more mundane if you will so but i will make it uh, more basic as well as a gallery of um, pathology uh, pictures so that you will understand what happens with structural changes in the kidney due to drug toxicities when you do evaluation of renal biopsy during allograft dysfunction uh, a variety of uh, uh, conditions have to be considered they are uh, allograft rejection and uh, any repeated biopsies for guide to therapies but also causes other than rejection that can cause renal dysfunction and among them medication and drug induced um, uh, toxicities and dysfunction is quite uh, is, is sometimes seen so if you look at the wide variety of uh, drugs uh, immunosuppressive agents and biological agents and other uh, medications like pro prophylactic medications that these patients get um it is uh, it is surprising that they do not get drug toxicity a lot more more often than what we see now in any uh, the other point that i wanted to make about all these medications is each has its own pathogenic mechanisms underlying pathophysiology in causing tissue injury by way of different inflammatory inhibiting different inflammatory pathways a specific to these drug the structure of these molecular structure of these drugs so that includes also prophylactic medications that we give them as antibacterials antiviral or antifungal they also can show interstitial nephritis or tubular toxicity 
So if you look at the renal parenchymal or structural change is secondary to toxicity, most renal lesions are nonspecific, really. They can be acute or chronic, and they can be reversible or irreversible. So any part of the renal parenchymal tissue can be affected by toxicity, but mainly tubular interstitial lesions are common. But in some situations, vascular, glomerular, and metabolic lesions, as well as metabolic effects are also seen. So now the immunosuppressive agents, if you come to the toxicity, many of them or almost all of them currently that we use target the T cell uh, cells um, pathways or the antigen presenting cell interaction. At the bottom here in this diagram, you have the antigen presenting cell that interacts very early with the T cells causing activation. And you can see the number of molecules uh, that interact with the T cell to stimulate it so that that will cause T cell proliferation and also elaborate the IL-2 and some of the other cytokines and chemokines, which will potentiate the, um, the quality of the immune reaction. So in many of these pathways have now been um, found to be blocked by a number of biological agents or medications. The commonly used ones that we are familiar with are cyclosporin and tacrolimus that inhibit the calcineurin enzyme here, which activates the NFAT, which is a nuclear factor of the activating T cell. And this, when the act, the after activation goes into the nucleus, uh, to, to cause the transcription of the IL-2 uh, for mRNA so that the IL-2 cytokine is produced and goes out of the cell to potentiate and increase the immune reaction, help with T cell proliferation. So in addition to that, there are other um, molecules on the antigen presenting cell. What we know is belatacept acts on the CTLA-4 and there are other uh, uh, molecules and, and biological agents that they have tried to use in, these, uh, in this setting. So if you come to calcineurin inhibitors, these are common drugs that we use almost in all transplant cases, including other solid organ transplants. So cyclosporin A comes from a, a fungus and uh, tacrolimus, uh, is, uh, was derived from a bacterium called Streptomyces sucubiensis. So even though these two molecules, the, the molecular makeup of uh, cyclosporin and tacrolimus are totally different, but they do act on one target, which is the calcineurin, calcineurin right here within the cell, inside the cell. Cyclosporin binds to cyclophilin, a protein, while the tacrolimus binds to FK binding protein. And that uh, inhibits the calcineurin, so much so it stops the activation of NFAT, which is the nuclear factor of activated T cells. And thus it blocks the uh, release of the activated interleukin-2 into the system to cause stimulation of the immune response. In addition, the CNIs also, um, also uh, enhance the TGF beta expression, which increases the immunosuppressive effect. So transplanted and native kidneys affected by calcineurin inhibitor toxicity is dose related with variable but uh, individual, uh, individual susceptibilities. Functional toxicity is there, which is reversible, even though there is acute kidney dysfunction associated with afferent arteriolar vasoconstriction. We will talk more about the structural part of the CNI toxicity, which is primarily tubular and vascular toxicity and sometimes thrombotic microangiopathy. The clinical features are quite nonspecific, if you will which is acute or chronic elevation of serum creatinine. Elevated blood or serum levels of um, CNI are often documented in such cases. And correlation of structural tissue injury with blood levels 
is strong in uh, in some studies, but in some studies they 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 cannot, such as the isometric vacualization, cannot be correlated too well with the blood levels. So having said that, this is a, a schema that I took from the Heptinstall's pathology uh, this, uh, of the kidney. And if you look at the, the structural toxicity of CNI here, let's go to this, the left side, tubules, the early minor changes or those that are reversible, and then go to some of the partially reversible or permanent changes. And I will show you some pictures. The earliest change, or sometimes a very non-specific change, is severe acute tubular injury, and clearly we do uh, we can see some degree of elevated CNI inhibitors uh, in this setting, and uh, and often there is no rejection here, of course, and you can see that the tubules, the tubules are flattened, dilated, loss of brush border severe tubular epithelial injury or single tubular epithelial injury can cause uh, significant renal dysfunction. So this is a non-specific change, partly may be related to the hemodynamic changes that occur due to the vascular uh, spasm and arteriolar spasm. So sometimes, uh, particularly professor in the olden days, in the 70s and 80s and 90s, they saw um, they saw giant mitochondria as part of the tubular toxic changes. Um, this was particular. This was observed uh, quite a bit by Professor Mihash in Basel, Switzerland. And I felt that now we do not see this as often, probably because we can control the levels of CNI much better nowadays. So having said that, the most common reversible toxic change that we do see in the tubules, but uh, affecting the mostly the proximal tubules and sometimes a few of the distal tubules is what is known as isometric vacuolization. You can see the fine, small vacuoles within the tubular cells, which appear to be equal to each other. They're fairly, the isometric means they're fairly equal to each other in size and they look alike and they fill the tubules and they sometimes displace, they may sometimes displace the nuclei. Often I may see uh, intact brush borders in these, in these tubules. So the reversibility is quite common if we can identify this and take away the, the lower the levels of tacrolimus and slowly the reversibility will occur. But other than that, at this point, these tubules become uh, quite non-functional or dysfunctional. So again, and what are they due to? They're due to dilated endoplasmic reticulum that cause the clear vacuoles, often reversible dose related, may not correlate entirely with renal function or the levels. And um, again, the, uh, the question that we always are asked is how much of the isometric vacuolization do you need for a renal dysfunction? It all depends on what else is going on in the kidney, but in a clean kidney without any other pathology, I would at least look for about 35 to 40% of the tubules being affected uh, by isometric vacuolization. But again, I, this particular finding can be quite non-specific if you do not consider other causes, particularly in the setting of transplant whether they have received IVIG. Although nowadays the IVIG does not carry a hypertonic solution. So we can be rest assured that it is not quite common. All the similar findings can be seen in patients who are on osmotic diuretics and maybe severe acute tubular injury can cause something like this. This is an electron microscopic picture just to give you a closer look at what exactly means the isometric vacuolization, where you have on the right side of the, the tubular cells here, the dark areas are all the mitochondria and they're separated by these uh, clear vacuoles which are dilated endoplasmic reticulum. Often the brush border is preserved in these patients, in these cases, and also in the left 
uh, the tubule right here. So reversibility is often quite possible. Then if you let it go for some time, you can still see some residual isom isometric and tubular vacuolization, but you also see some of these dark material, which is tubular microcalcific bodies. So much of the, um, the tubules that undergo severe injury now start to undergo calcification and that causes tubular loss. Often because of the persistent tubular injury, we might see some margination of the peritubular capillaries by inflammatory cells. So this is a late uh, kind of finding. And sometimes these, uh, uh, the, these patients may not recover the baseline creatinine. So if we now come to the arteriolar changes, there are early minor changes, again, which can be reversible when you lower the levels of calcineurin inhibitors. And there may be some early changes, which may be major, um, such as thrombotic microangiopathy and intimal severe um, endothelial injury and intimal thickening and fibrin thrombi. So let us go and see some of these pictures now. So these are the much more reversible um, uh, forms of uh, vascular injury or vascular toxicity. These, the vacuolization that you see here are actually uh, the smooth muscle cell of the arteriole. They show uh, acute vacuolization because of toxicity. And occasionally you may see some microthrombosis, which you see here on the right lower corner. And medial cell vacuolization and necrosis can be seen occasionally that we've seen. And these are the points where the medial cell vacuolization eventually drop out, the cells drop out, and there may be early hyalinosis or hyalinization. So these are some of the acute findings. Eventually, what happens is you may still see some vacuolization of the medial um, cells, or the smooth muscle cells, and we also see some replacement uh, gradually by, uh, by, uh, by hyalinosis, which causes both intimal hyalinosis as well as medial hyalinosis, which cause slow obliterative change of the microvasculature. That uh, adds another additional element of uh, uh, renal insult to uh, that is uh, caused by ischemia, microvascular um, obliterative changes. Here is a beautiful picture of an arteriole that shows both medial hyalinosis and significant intimal hyalinosis. And these are permanent and they cannot be reversible at this time. And also in the lower right corner, you see the same thing. However, medial hyalinosis can also be seen in malignant hypertensive changes healing thrombotic microangiopathy of any case, um, not only transplant, and uh, sometimes as incidental findings in normal kidneys. Well, can we see um, this type of uh, vascular changes in tacrolimus uh, toxicity or CNI toxicity in a native kidney? Of course, with other organ transplants, heart transplant or liver transplant, uh, you can see the uh, CNI toxicity changes in the kidney. Sometimes CNIs are given to um, patients with autoimmune diseases, psoriasis, uh, rheumatoid arthritis, and some of these patients can also develop toxicities, uh, vascular toxicity and tubular toxicity in the kidney. This is just to give you a closer look at what is the arteriolar hyalinosis and how it develops within the, um, uh, within the arteriole, you can see much of the um, intima is replaced and, uh, and the endothelium it gets separated, elastica gets separated from the media, which is due to the accumulation of intimal and medial hyalinosis. So much so the BAMF transplant pathology has a hyalinosis score, arteriolar hyalinosis score, because the pathologic, these pathologic findings contribute towards graft dysfunction. Mild is one, uh, one arteriole affected by hyalinosis, 
uh, mild to moderate is where uh, to, uh, the grade two is um, mild to moderate where more than one arteriole is affected. And grade three is that many arterioles being affected segmentally or circumferentially. So the, the other chronic tubular interstitial changes that one might see which are irreversible are the uh, striped cortical fibrosis or tubular atrophy. And this is mainly because of vascular microvascular sclerosis and ischemia. And this is the reason for the striped fibrosis that you see here. And, uh, and also some of the glomeruli may show segmental sclerosing lesions for the same reason. Here also you see the striped uh, fibrosis, tubular atrophy and interstitial fibrosis. So these are characteristic of CNI toxicity, but not specific. It represents areas of least perfusion, and it is secondary to vascular ischemia, which could be arteriolar or microvascular obliterative changes, or sometimes due to persistent vas vasospasm, endothelial injury, healed thrombotic microangiopathy, or hyalinosis in this setting. So if you look at the chronic vascular CNI toxicity, what are some of the glomerulate consequences of this vascular toxicity? As I showed you already, there can be some segmental partial or global glomerulosclerosis as a result of this progressive obliterative changes. And sometimes an ischemic podocytopathy an ischemic epithelial injury causes collapsing glomerulopathy, which can cause intractable uh, proteinuric state up to nephrotic range, which does not respond to treatment. So then we will go to the more uh, glomerular lesions, which can be acute or chronic, or which is fairly major at this point. And I would go through a clinical history in. Uh, before I show you the pictures, as an instance of a 40-year-old female with hypertension and end-stage disease had received a deceased donor transplant uh, with a decreased uh, creatinine to 4.0. After following induction and early steroid withdrawal, uh, and she was put on um, M MMF and tacrolimus. Two weeks later, she comes back with anuria pain over the graft creatinine of 7.9 and a high blood pressure. There was no evidence of donor specific antibodies to suspect antibody mediated rejection this early in the transplant. So peripheral blood smear showed schistocytes. There was anemia. Also the LDH was high and the haptoglobin was undetectable. The tacrolimus level at this time was 12.3. So they treated the patient by hemodialysis, gave her IgIg, uh, took away the cyclosporin that she, she was on and gave her some rituxan to cover for, the, for any rejection process. And a month later, they did the kidney biopsy. And as you can see, the glomeruli still show persistent uh, fibrin thrombi, intraglomerular or capillary fibrin thrombi the loose mesangial areas or mesangiolysis and hilar arteriolar thrombi with fragmented red cells extravasation. This is the trichrome stain to show you the same thing, the, the dark red fibrin thrombi, including the hilar arteriole. Yeah, and these are the patients who had a fairly severe hyalinosis, medial and intimal hyalinosis that already developed in this case within the last uh, two weeks itself. And here you see a nice clean picture of a hilar arteriole with uh, fragmented red cells which showing um, um, a microthrombus sitting in the arteriole obstructing that. So what about CNI induced TM TMA? In, it can occur in most solid organ transplants. Thankfully, it is much rarer now because we do do uh, we do monitor the levels very carefully or usually occurs within the first two months of transplant without any evidence of rejection. The contributing factors could be a potentiation of the endothelial injury that might have been primed by thymoglobulin or they can be a second hit by a viral or a bacterial infection. 
So it is, there could be a direct effect of CNI on endothelial injury uh, on endothelial cells as well. The treatment is discontinuation of the CNI, give them steroids and substitute with another immunosuppressive therapy. There is increased tendency of TMA with microemulsion form, which we do not use anymore, and serolimus. The pathogenesis is a variety of uh, mechanistic uh, changes in the endothelium that, that goes wrong and uh, causes a variety of biochemical um, uh, you know, insult to the functioning of the endothelial injury to the functioning of the endothelial cell leading to endothelial injury. And these are some of the various factors that cause endothelial injury um, at this point. In some of the chronic features, sometimes we, we may not notice the acute. They may come with some degree of proteinuria. And what we see is um, the chronic TMA-like change or transplant glomerulopathy-like change in the absence of uh, antibody-mediated rejection. This is healed uh, endothelial injury with basement membrane remodeling. So now the renal pathologic findings that we see with CNI toxicity are not specific, as I mentioned earlier. So with each of these, as I mentioned earlier, the tubulopathy with isometric vacuolization can be caused in other situations. TMA, in the setting of transplants, you have to consider other causes. Uh, and CNI arteriolopathy can be due to, um, that can resemble diabetic halinosis or hypertensive halinosis or pre-existing donor disease. And a CNI glomerulopathy may be due to secondary to other cause, secondary causes of TMA or transplant glomerulopathy and other glomerular lesions. So you may have to distinguish all of them before you establish them as related to CTM, to cyclosporin. So now rapamycin, which is a mammalian, which acts on the mammalian target of rapamycin or the mTOR, is an inhibitor of that mTOR. Is a macrolide from uh, antibiotic from Streptomyces hygroscopicus is used as a steroid sparing agent in the setting of transplants and also to spare the CNI to toxicity in the tissue. It also, it has again, hit, this molecular um, uh, architecture resembles what we see in uh, tacrolimus. Although the, the action is not like tacrolimus, which is a CNI toxicity, a CNI, CN inhibitor. It bind, this binds to FK binding protein just like the other one, but then binds to mTOR, which is a kinase that regulates pathways of cell cycle regulators. So thus it will prevent the T cell proliferation and differentiation from a different perspective by inhibiting cytokines and growth factor simulated signals. So it also has another um, uh, path of injury, which is it blocks the production of vascular endothelial growth factor. And why I'm saying that is that this particular virtue of you know, VEGF inhibition can cause a podocytopathy and podocyte injury within the glomeruli leading to proteinuria focal segmental sclerosis, and sometimes a nephrotic range proteinuria as well. So rapamycin um, also rarely produces another rare toxic reaction in the kidney, which has been reported by the Seattle group many years ago, which was, uh, what, which resembles a a cast myeloma cast nephropathy like picture with necrotic eosinophilic casts that obstruct the tubules. Um, and I'm finishing, I, I, since we started a few minutes late, I need a couple more minutes. Um, so these, this is quite rare. And once you remove the medication, some of them have recovered. So Belartacept, which is a CTLA-4 um, you know, antibody acting on the antigen-presenting cell, um, the side effect is it has a trend toward high rates of early rejection. 
also the potential for an increased risk of post-transplant lymphoproliferative disorders. In addition to the chronic tacrolimus toxicity involving tubular interstitial vascular and glomerular changes, some instances there have shown post-transplant de novo diabetic, diabetes mellitus as a result of the, um, the suppression of islets in the pancreas. One word about uh, the development of uh, acute allergic or hypersensitivity-related interstitial nephritis in the transplants due to sulfur drugs or any of the prophylactic drugs. They can cause an, an allergic reaction with which is rich in eosinophils or sometimes also a granulomatous inflammation. When it is just the pure eosinophil-rich T-cell reaction, you cannot differentiate it from T-cell um, TCMR or T-cell mediated rejection. But fortunately, um, steroid therapy actually helps to minimize this or to take away this. Sometimes these patients may present with fever, rash, or eosinophilia, but it is not very, it is not a constant finding or consistent finding. And uh, the other uh, thing is vancomycin related tubular injury, necrosis, and cast nephropathy are, are responsible for severe tubular injury and sometimes patchy interstitial nephritis as well. And uh, reversibility may not be complete depending on the severity of the tubular injury and necrosis. Antiviral therapies can also cause tubular necrosis and nephrocalcinosis. And this is uh, taken from uh, Dr. Liapis's book, uh, where foscarnet, which was used for one of the parasitic infections and uh, severe uh, fungal infections, uh, caused uh, nephrocalcinosis. Lastly, the, the last this this is the last uh, but one slide, which I wanted to make a mention of kidney transplants and immune checkpoint inhibitors, where these patients have advanced cancer for which immune checkpoint inhibitors are used. The, the problem here is our routine CNI immunosuppressive agents block the T cell activation. But if you give immune um, mediated checkpoint inhibitors to these patients who are on immunosuppressives, this actually upregulates and activates the T cell so that they can attack the tumor. So there are opposing um, uh, actions that come into play here. And if the ICPIs are more, uh, take an upper hand, then these patients, there can uh, be, um, they can develop acute cell, reje uh, cell mediated rejection kind of reaction, interstitial nephritis in these transplants, which can also lead to graft dysfunction and often graft loss. So when they do start these medications, they do one other thing, which will put them at risk for a rejection, which is they lower the immunosuppression so that the patient can mount an effective immune response against the malignancy by, by T cell activation. This can also increase the risk of rejection. So there should be a happy balance between how much uh, of these uh, inhibitors can be given uh, uh, and balance it with the immunosuppressive uh, therapy so as to prevent um, uh, to, to prevent rejection. Nearly 40 to 50 percent so far in certain some studies have developed ACR within a, a matter of three to six weeks on average or later. The interstitial nephritis again can, is not distinguishable from T cell mediated rejection by pathology. However, the Boston group has uh, taken one step further and did gene expression profiling in such cases and found um, and they used several control groups, including uh, immune checkpoint inhibitor, drug-induced AIN, uh, and, the, and the acute TCMR group, and um, a, a group which, have, which shows uh, the AIN related to ICPI in the transplant. And in their uh, elaborate analysis of many genes, they, use the, they used um, uh, the nanostring uh, uh, 
seven, which has seven, 770 genes that can be analyzed on paraffin embedded tissue. And this, this principal component analysis has found that much of the reaction that takes place because of the ICPIs uh, does not really um, uh, does not really correlate or overlap with the TCMR genes. Only very little overlap is there. And they have found that there may be some correlation of I, the uh, expression of IF127 or FOS genes uh, that get expressed more with TCMR and not with the reaction of this. So there are some studies that have come up recently to separate the two of them. I will skip these in the interest of time, just to say that newer drugs, biological agents to uh, interrupt the various T cell activating uh, pathways are now um, uh, being considered and, and used in trials. Um, and also additional drugs to interrupt some of the inter, uh, cellular interactions, the T cell interaction to the B cell interaction and also the plasma cells um, to block the plasma cells for the plasma cell rich rejection processes. So they're all being uh, used in different uh, trials or capacities and in, in different institutions to identify a good combination of anti-immunosuppressive therapy these, for these patients. So in summary, a transplant patient is exposed to a variety of categories of medications and biologic agents in order to prevent rejection um, and prophylaxis against all forms of infections and um, uh, and the treatment of concurrent comorbidities. They can be acute, chronic, reversible, or irreversible. They can pose, the CNI can pose most common form of uh, adverse effects. They are the most common. Chronic, chronic forms being more common than the acute because of the regular monitoring of the drug levels to reduce toxic effects. Awareness of side effects of other drugs, drug interactions, um, you know, though less frequent, may minimize the significant allograft injury in such cases. A renal biopsy in this setting is useful to identify structural changes secondary to rejection, infection, drug-induced disease, or other insults. Thank you very much. Thank you, Dr. Surya. You really addressed this uh, very important topic of drug toxicity in transplant patient. Uh, very beautifully, and I'm very impressed actually, and learned a lot with clarity. Thank you very much. Yeah, you're welcome. Very, very Thank nice. You. We could understand you very nicely. Thank you. Yeah. I, I don't have any questions to ask you, <laughs> but there, yeah. there's some recent literature I wanted to share. I saw an interesting article. You know, you mentioned the tubular vacuolization. There was an article where remdesivir, you know, the vehicle in that yes. drug causes yes. you know, nephropathy yeah. with isometric vacuolization. And then similarly, one of the immune checkpoint inhibitors, nivolumab, yeah. there was a yeah. patient with remdesivir cell carcinoma, uh -huh. and he also developed isometric vacuolization. So a lot of medications have vehicles yeah. which render the drugs hyper or smaller. Right, right. And yes. I also wanted to restress the point that you made that drug toxicities must always be a diagnosis of exclusion. Right. And there is actually in the early 2000s, there were some very prominently, uh, you know, uh, received articles in the New England Journal of Medicine. And basically, whenever they would find arterial or highline change in a biopsy, they would call it cyclosporin toxicity. <laughs> without even bothering yes. to check the age, the hypertension, the diabetes. Right. Yes. And I think articles like those did a disservice to the community because right. they so much overinflated the incidence mm -hmm. of cyclosporin toxicity that mm -hmm. it triggered many trials, some of which are still going on, which were calcineurin free inhibitor trials. And their mm -hmm. intent was good, but it was based on a premise which was not exactly correct. And so yeah. many of these cyclosporine-free uh, regimens, they are complicated by high rates of rejection. You know? So yes. we as pathologists must be very careful not to jump at the diagnosis of cyclosporine toxicity, 
talk to the clinicians, does it make sense to them? And right. make sure the, and especially today, when we have older and older donors, there's a lot yeah. of arterial high line change to yeah. begin with. If yes. you take a biopsy on day seven or day 10, you're gonna find arterial high line change. So we should be yeah. cautious in making a diagnosis because yeah. most grafts are probably not lost to cyclosporine toxicity. It causes dysfunction, but not graft yeah. loss. So the yeah. other side of the equation is more harmful that you make a wrong diagnosis and you lower the immunosuppression that's likely the better option to avoid. Yes, thank you for your wisdom always, uh, Paramjit. Uh, and uh, reinforcing, uh, you know, some of the non-specific findings. You know, the cyclosporin, if I may just comment on this and close, um, the cyclosporin uh, um, uh, hyalinosis was actually uh, uh, promoted when you know in the, in the early days of cyclosporin toxic um, when they uh, cyclosporin use when they didn't monitor the uh, the the level so much and and the incidence of the toxicity was fairly high both vascular uh, and tubular toxicity so that is when they realized that they started to see increased hyalinosis and I think they carried it over but uh, you are right in saying that nowadays uh, it is not as common as it was before. Thank yes. you, ma'am. That was a very yes. informative session. Thank you, ma'am, for sharing your views with us. Also, I thank all the chairpersons for their valuable time.